Hello all, and now I want to look at what I think is one of the most fascinating chapters in Joseph Campbell's Mask of the God series, Volume 1, which is Chapter 4, on the myth of ritual regicide kings. And so essentially this myth that Campbell's going to be using with uh, the likes of Leo Forbanius and um, as Fraser would allude to the ritual regicide in the Golden Bough, um, we're really looking now at these myths and how these structures of, of where they originate and how this is going to play into the relationship of the uh, planters and uh, human sacrifice as such. And so this tale, uh, which was handed by Forbanius in the Sudan, a uh, chief of uh, uh, camel drivers, um, basically told him this story of the legend of the destruction of cash. And so the setting for the tale is set back in the Sudan back when it was actually a, a green vegetation uh, instead of the desert we see today. And so this was a, a very prominent, rich culture, civilization. We have, of course, the sovereign or the king who is put to death or at least has a predetermined seven year cycle typically where all of the kings, his court, and uh, really anyone with any sort of connection to the sovereign, if you would like, is to be put down and uh, locked away into this vestal and, and um, you know, there's, there's this sort of ceremonial or symbolic fire. Uh, fire is always typically seen as a sort of renewal or um, to uh, refine, if you would like. Nonetheless, this Kindle fire is to be uh, allowed to exhaust itself over the process of the king's court uh, for, again, seven years. And um, there's an appointed boy and girl who, of course, are virgins and appointed by the new king and of the executed king's sister's son. In this case, we're talking about uh, Akov. And when the king ascends to the throne, he has to appoint who will be sacrificed with him. So essentially, when you have a new king and he brings about his court, you begin uh, cycling towards the next sacrifice and one of which in particular in this tale is of importance is Farley Moss, who is the king's storyteller. And uh, the other important character is his sister, Solly, uh, the king's sister, um, who is appointed. And um, Solly and, and really the king also, uh, they're not really too thrilled at the idea of being sacrificed, of course, at the end of this seven year cycle. Uh, and there's sort of predetermination is looming on them. And so Akov, uh, you know, he's feeling depressed about this. And so he asks for a story from Farley Moss. And Farley Moss is this very skilled storyteller who, you know, elucidates and presents these stories in such a way it puts Akov into this dreamlike state or, or at least uh, takes away his troubles and, and leaves them temporary of the looming uh, human sacrifice that they're about to uh, partake in. And uh, each night, of course, as we'll get into with A Thousand and One Nights and how that uh, relates to this myth, um, each night he returns to Farley Moss to get more of these stories as they're, you know, sort of left with this um, you know, cliffhanger, if you would like. And so this allure for storytelling, of course, tips off everyone in the kingdom and his reputation as this great storyteller uh, begins to precede himself. And that is when, of course, he meets Solly. And of course, it's love at first sight with these two. And so he puts the court to sleep every night with his storytellings. And every night, Solly, uh, you know, they, they sort of kindle and, and create a sort of romantic motif where they profess their love to each other. And um, eventually this makes Solly want to go to the high priest to ask, of course, you know, who determines what really happens to this sacrifice? What are the logics of it, if you would like? 
And of course, the high priest says that this is uh, determined by the divine, or at least the stars. Uh, they're basically astrom astronomers in their own time. And so Sali, being a heretic, claims that Farley Moss and, and the life on Earth is actually, and she's very uh, Nietzschean in that sort of sense, that the real world is actually the one that's worth living in. It's um, not of a, a greater importance of, of the divine and its rule. And so Sali convinces the high priest to come see Farley Moss's stories for themselves because, of course, the high priests uh, you know, say this is blasphemy. And so the high priest is, just as everyone else, enamored with the storytelling of Farley Moss. And so uh, he drifts right to sleep. And Sali and Farley Moss, of course, profess their love to each other again before repeating this for the next couple of nights. And word and his reputation keeps increasing. So more and more of the high priests and, and just the kingdom in large is uh, taken aback by Farley Moss's storytelling to the point where they've actually lost track of the stars themselves and what the divine is trying to connect and, and relay to the people and so they realize that the astronomy has been disrupted and they're actually wrong in their uh, planetary uh, dissection uh, or observance. And so the high priests meet over this and they have to suggest that Farley Moss is uh, too much of a heretic. He has to be put to death um, for subverting the gods. And um, the high priest announces this and Sali um, says that she will consult her brother about... Uh, or the king about Farley Moss because of course the king you know he knows in the ritual that he is to be put to death first uh, so he must die before Farley Moss in the sequence and so the high priest agrees to this that you know, the, the king must also die and with that of course bring about a new uh, kindling fire and ritual Rasali requests that she is to be granted uh, Farley Moss for it is her own destiny and uh, her brother grants this for her um, but in the meantime there is this massive ceremony for Farley Moss to you know tell one of his stories again he's just enamored the entire kingdom now um, and so the whole the entire town gathers to hear this story and during the night uh, as predicted there is a, a an act of divine intervention to happen and all of the high priests, uh, the entire cast, end up dead and um, uh, in their sleep. And so Akoff, uh, leading to the end of this myth here, he is the first king to reign um, until he dies of natural causes. And he eludes the sacrifice. And so this bucks the tradition uh, through this myth here. Uh, and Farley Moss actually inherits the kingdom and reigns over a golden age because, of course, he marries Sali. And um, the kingdom of Sudan, uh, this ancient civilization, uh, prospers until Farley Moss passes away himself and then uh, the empire falls and they are invaded. And so this story told to Forbanius by the camel driver is relating to the end of the practice of sacrifice. Uh, but uh, Campbell digs a, a bit to find, or at least Forbanius did, that there is a Hellenic tradition going on with uh, really the African kings, or at least in particular the Ethiopian one, where um, you know the Hellenics basically taught in the classical education that uh, human sacrifice is barbarism, and so... This myth really is how the story is told for the practice of it to be eradicated in, in, in the king's regicide. Um, and so this myth is an echo of such tradition that put an end to this tradition. And also the relationship you could see, as I alluded to earlier, of the 1001 Nights with yeah, Farley Moss being swapped out with uh, Shirtzad, who is uh, soon to be put to death, but each night it's delayed by her storytelling until she eventually bears the children of the king. Of course, her life is spared, and um, 
eventually she becomes the queen herself. And so Campbell adds on here from this anecdote from Forbanius, and he also sprinkles in the insights of Al-Mazudi, the uh, Arab historian, that of course there is Persian archetypes and influence all throughout uh, these myths as they're um, you know, going about the uh, cultural uh, circle zone. And you know, despite being Arabic or Syrian, at least in uh, their discovery, uh, ranging all the way from 800 to 1400 AD, these are ultimately Persian uh, prototypes. They're the you know long Islamic tradition of storytelling. The Persians, of course, are famous for being storytellers, while the Arabs uh, uh, were not. So, out of this, Campbell suggests that. You know, many of uh, these civilizations had a similar way, and, and again, this is how he you know, establishes a comparative mythology. We're doing that here in this chapter where you know, we're looking at these different stories, um, of these great wonder tales in the Middle Ages that you know, go from Europe um, and, or well, go from the Middle East across to India and Japan and influence into Europe. And Forbanius would point out that under the uh, Arabian and Sudanese tale, that in gathering these anecdotes, he was uh, told that all of these stories actually uh, come from Yemen and, and an ancient civilization that was once held there that really trace back to all of these uh, regicide tales. And so the practices uh, and really myths of the regicide is again, demonstrating that diffuse uh, circle zone as uh, Forbanius contributed and um, Campbell then would suggest that there is an even older myth of this dating to the ancient city-states such as uh, Rook in Mesopotamia. We have evidence then in a Rook that the similar sacrifice and the practice of the king's regicide was being done um, you know dying with a, a group of virgins around Campbell would say that you know we see this sort of formalized logic of course the seven-year cycle all of these different rituals that there must have been a sort of uh, origin or a story that precedes even this that was you know before even the, the, this formalization and, and the the sovereign and, and the king to all be sacrificed and in the practice of the vestal fire being put out among the village, um, Campbell talks about this uh, pubescent boy and girl uh, who the boy uh, exhibits the fire stick and of course she gives the placement to maneuver with the fire stick and then they are to lose their virginity, they are pr to procreate before they're rolled into a pit and sacrificed ultimately to become one with the earth. And this story goes back even further than, again, with mathematics, astrology, the sovereign uh, state of the civilization and what it represents uh, predates uh, all of that with this older idea that he wants to explore in later chapters on the plant in the vessel, which, you know, the, the vessel, if you would like, is, is someone in the community uh, that's represented uh, of the sacred plant that is to be sacrificed and this is exhibited on their um, first sex act uh, and this myth also and and really I want to uh, relay uh, this final thought here with really just how you know the metaphysics uh, these sort of stories uh, really act um, or, or will uh, when they're you know, disassembled when they're deconstructed, if you would like, in contemporary terms. This is going to have ramifications for the greater civilization. We, again, talked earlier about the decline of this empire with the fall uh, and natural death of Farley Moss. And so you have tangible, concrete happenings. Uh, I, I kind of uh, think of Gebser with, uh, you know, how he discusses the fall of uh, city walls and architecture with uh, the uh, invention of, of gunpowder 
and how this would actually change the conscious structures or move them along, uh, uh, mutate them as he would have put it. Um, and, and so there, again, uh, you know, civilizations have these high uh, metaphysical ideas that, you know, once they are tampered with, you begin to actually see exhibit in real concrete happenings of a, a province or, or a civilization and um, how this would play into the shifting of, of a consciousness, which I think is interesting to put here at the end of this chapter. And so if you guys enjoyed this video as we've moved along here quite a bit through the Mass of God, Volume 1, and you want to see more of it, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this video, and I'll see you for the next installment. Sorry for um, the lack of uploads lately. I've had uh, a lot going on, um, so I hope to get back on a more stable schedule soon uh, with Campbell here.